Good evening. Okay, I hear everybody's in the room. So I would ask you to find a seat so we can get started. We are already have the academic quarter of an hour. I think now we're ready to go. Perfect, great. So good evening again uh, to everybody in the room, but also to the people following this event online. I bid you a very warm welcome to our event, Reclaiming Our Digital Future, Shedding Light on Big Tech Lobbying in the European Parliament. My name is Alexandra Gese. I'm a vice president of the Greens EFA Group. I've been here since 2019. I work on digital policy, and in particular, I've been the shadow rapporteur on the Digital Services Act. And I have made some personal experiences with big, top, big tech lobbying that were quite interesting. Not only the fact that basically all think tanks are in some way funded by Google, Amazon, Meta, still, still Facebook at the time, and co. But it was also very, very difficult to find independent experts who would come and speak to us about certain topics in the committee. Even when we had official committee meetings, we were, had experts presenting to us. Um, and then during the meeting, we found out um, the same person was also the academic co-director of a Google-funded uh, think tank that ded dedicated to big tech regulation and particularly probably dedicated to representing Google's interest in the room. And I think... One of the worst experiences was an, an organization called the 3CCC, which was supposed to be an organization of uh, very small enterprises, uh, small companies. And um, it was very strange because then when I emailed back and said I would be happy to speak with one of these small entrepreneurs, I was told, oh, no, you can't. You can just speak to us because we are representing. They don't have time. So I asked the journalists in Germany to investigate them and find some of these small enterprises. And they, it turned out they didn't even know they were supposed to be a part of that organization. But uh, on the website, you could find the Google funding, obviously. <laughs> and these people made press releases, for example, attacking green digital policy. Um, they sent emails and, and before the last plenary votes on a daily basis, basically. And you know that not all of the 700 members uh, in this house have time to check that kind of organization's out. Most people, when they get an email from an organization of small and medium enterprises, believe that that organization is representing their interests. And I think we have seen a lot more uh, with the AI Act, so that's what we're going to dive into today. So we want to find out how lobbying in the digital field works in Brussels and how big tech lobbying strategies influence the work of the European Parliament. What are the challenges faced by civil society organizations? And we have a lot speaking to us uh, tonight. I'm very happy that they could have share their time with us and their experiences. So what are the challenges they are facing in making their vo voices heard vis-a-vis -vis large corporations which are active in digital policies? And they are very active, I can confirm. What are potential pathways to reduce the impact of big tech lobbying? And how can we make the lobbying process overall more transparent? And above all, how can we reclaim our digital future? I'm very happy uh, to have the honor to introduce um, a long list of, of very interesting speakers. And we start with a very particular keynote speech. It's a video message. But our keynote speaker tonight is Cory Doctorow. Cory is a science fiction novelist. There he is. Uh, good to see you, Kari. Uh, science fiction novelist, journalist, and technology activist. He's a special consultant to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a leading U.S. nonprofit organization that defends privacy, freedom of speech, and innovation. He holds an honorary doctorate in computer science from the Open University. He's also an MIT Media Lab research affiliate and a visiting professor of practice at the University of North Carolina School of Library and Information Science. Last but not least, Corey is a global thought leader on digital rights issues and open source technology. So we are very happy to have his contribution to kick off tonight's panel discussion. Hi. I'm Cory Doctorow. I've been asked to say a few words about the relationship between big tech, lobbying, and the decline of the internet as we understand it. So I think it's tempting to have a very simplistic equation when we contemplate how lobbying takes place, where if an industry is sufficiently wealthy, it can capture its regulators, 
and get the rules that it wants. But that's not always true. I started in uh, digital human rights back in the era of the Napster Wars, when a small number of mostly record labels, a few TV and, and uh, movie companies wanted to add surveillance and censorship to the internet in order to fight copyright infringement. And um, those companies were quite small relative to the tech companies that would bear the brunt of those enforcement burdens and whose products would be made worse as a result of it. Uh, but there were only seven or eight entertainment companies and there were like a hundred tech companies. And the hundred tech companies, they weren't cozy. They competed. They didn't like each other. They often didn't know each other personally. The industry was too big for everyone to know each other. They not only couldn't agree on what their lobbying position was, they couldn't agree on like where to hold the meeting where they would come up with that lobbying position, much less uh, how to cater it, much less what that position that emerged from it would be. So it's quite ironic because today, as the internet degrades into what uh, Tom Eastman calls five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four, we see the reverse happening where tech has become extremely uh, inbred to the point where it practically has a Habsburg jaw, where tech companies have acquired one another and where they have found it very easy to stick to a single lobbying position. And the lobbying position they've arrived at is that it should be as hard as possible for us to leave their platforms, that wherever it is possible, they should be able to impose what an economist would call a collective action problem on us, where we have to choose between our friends and staying on the platform, where if you leave Facebook, you leave behind the communities, the customers, the family members, the colleagues who matter to you there. And that means that you will put up with a whole lot of bad conduct from Facebook without leaving. People look at um, all the users of tech platforms who stick around even when their management gets progressively worse whether that's uh, Twitter or Facebook or any of the other social media platforms. And they think maybe those things don't matter too much to people. Maybe people don't care about privacy or abuse or harassment. But I think what's more true to say is that they love the people who matter to them. And the collective action problem that arises when you and everyone you love are in one place and none of you like it, but you can't agree on where to go or what to do next is akin to that collective action problem that the tech sector had back in the Napster years, where you all agree that something should be done, but you can't agree on what to do. And so the, your adversary gets to ride roughshod over you. Now, um, the good news is that we don't have to have these high switching costs, these collective action problems for tech. The good news is that latent within technology is the capacity for all tech platforms to connect to all other tech platforms, what's called interoperability, where you plug one thing into another thing. Um, you can wear anyone's socks with the shoes that you put on this morning. Uh, you can wear anyone's belt with your trousers. You can put anyone's light bulb into a light socket. And you can always plug something into um, Facebook that lets you leave Facebook take up residence on another platform, maybe one run by and for the community that uses it, and continue to exchange messages with the people that you left behind. And that's the goal of the Digital Markets Act. The interoperability mandates in the DMA are all about solving that collective action problem so that when the tech platforms seek to harm us in order to help themselves, they pay the price that users leave. And users are insulated from the harms because we can leave. And um, I think that all of this points to another important domain of what we need to do about tech, which is not merely to make it easier to leave tech platforms, so that is very, very important, but also to make it harder for tech and for other companies to come to agreement about what their industry-wide lobbying position is going to be, to impose upon them the same collective action problem they have imposed upon us, to make them neither too big to fail nor too big to jail. And so that means muscular action on breakups and structural separation, where companies are not allowed, for example, to be a marketplace and the user of a marketplace, the way Google and Amazon and uh, uh, Facebook and Apple are. And likewise, breakups where firms that acquire other firms for predatory reasons, like Facebook buying WhatsApp and Instagram, 
in order to prevent users from leaving Facebook so that when they go somewhere else, they're still using a Facebook platform. All of, all of uh, those mergers should be unwound and new mergers like them should be prevented. And this is something that's gonna make all of the large corporations in the world very angry because they've all grown thanks to uh, the, the kinds of mergers that tech has employed in order to attain its scale. But the number of people who are potential partisans for preventing monopolies and breaking up the ones that have formed in every sector from beer to intermodal shipping, to banking, to tech, to movies, to publishing, it's effectively everyone in the world because except for the shareholders of these small number of firms that abuse us so horribly, everyone suffers as a result. And so we have a potential army on our side and it is yet to be seen which political faction or party or group will mobilize that army and claim it for their own. Lots of different tendencies are jockeying for it. Uh, in many places, the right is characterizing itself as the anti-woke corporate power uh, entity, but the right can never genuinely oppose corporate power because the right uh, is the, the movement that supports the wealthy and the elite. And so, um, it is up to the left and to social democratic parties to figure out who's gonna be the flag bearer for this movement. And the one that does is going to have a constituency like nothing we've seen. Thank you. I think we say thank you. That was an encouraging message and I can confirm that the, the right, at least the far right, is definitely not opposing corporate interests in this house when digital is concerned. <laughs> But there were also already two suggestions on what we can do to reclaim our digital futures, make these companies smaller and make them interoperable. Operable. Uh, once we said people then could make a choice with their feet, in that case, people can make a choice with their, with their keyboards. And I think that is already a very good start since we already started on this with the Digital Markets Act. So we would go on if we can. We can? Okay. Um, we would go on with a, a speaker that is who is connected remotely. We have really an online and offline event today. It's very hybrid. Oh, I have to make some general remarks. Um, I forgot that. We have one and a half hours. We already used 15 of them, more or less, uh, in total. We have five great speakers now who will make very short interventions in order to have enough time for how to have a Q&A after that. And we would wrap up by uh, eight, eight and a half past eight, more or less. So we start with the five speakers who give their specific inputs. And we start with Max Banks from Lobby Control, if it's working. We had some technical issues before, but I'm told it's working now. So Max is a researcher and campaign at Lobby Control, has been working there since 2013. He holds a PhD in economic history and his work focuses on the lobbying and monopoly power of big tech, and I think he will make some general introductive remarks. You have the floor, Max, if technology helps us. Working, can you hear me? Yes, we can, uh, very good. Uh, that's Go a great starting point, and thanks very much for the invitation. My role, as you say, Alexandra, is to talk about big tech's lobbying in the EU in general, to make a few introductory remarks and I'm going to make four points and please go on to the next slide. I will talk about lobbying power, lobby expenses first and its development, second on the role of think tanks in big tech lobbying, third on the role of SME alliances and other front groups, fourth about the role of economic consultancies with respect to big tech and finally draw a few conclusions. So please go on to the next slide. As you can see here, in the last two years, big tech lobby spending has been increasing. Two years ago, we published a report on big tech's lobbying power together with Corporate Europe Observatory. And since then, the expenses have been rising from 97 million to 100. 13 million in the whole industry, the tech industry, especially the expenses of big tech compared to the rest of the tech, tech industry have been rising. The importance of big tech's lobbying is also illustrated by the next slide, 
which shows that among the top six lobby spenders in the EU, we have Meta, Apple, Google and Microsoft. And please go on to the next slide. The increase is generally not surprising given the fact that we have a lot of ongoing legislation or finished legis legislation in the last two, two years that affects big tech like the DMA, the DSA, the AI Act and other pieces. But please note that big tech is by far outspending other powerful industries like the car industry as you see in this picture. Uh, the top, top 10 companies spent four times more than the top 10 car makers, the four top 10 big tech companies. And now two side notes. Please don't go on to the next slide already. Uh, first side note, big tech also lobbies heavily on the member state level because it has the resources to do that. And that's very important for the so-called trilog, the last phase of EU legislation. Just to provide an example, Amazon and Amazon Web Services together spent 2.4 million euro on its lobbying in Germany alone. A second side note, Chinese big tech has relatively low lobby expenses and a comparatively low number of meetings compared to Silicon Valley companies. Huawei and TikTok have been increasing their lobby spending in the last few years, but it's relatively small compared to Silicon Valley companies. This is a phenomenon we will look more into in the near future. Now please go on to the next slide. Big tech and the role of think tanks. Many of you probably know this slide from, from uh, social media. Please note that this is outdated and we are currently in the process of updating it uh, to be published, by the way, around uh, Black Friday, so the 24th of November. One thing, thing we can already say is that big tech relations to think tanks, be it membership or be it sponsoring alone, have not been decreasing, in some cases even been increasing. The close collaboration with think tanks, sometimes without disclosing the relationships, is a special feature of big tech's lobbying in the EU. During the DMA process and the DSA process, this led to outrageous publications like the one by the European Centre for International Political Economy, ECP, that warned of a massive GDP and job loss caused by the DMA. Academics in the field, on the other hand, like the former chief economist at DGCOMP, Tommaso Valletti, called the numbers in this report completely ridiculous. Anyway, this is something to keep in mind, and Alexandra mentioned it already, when you talk to think tanks in the EU. Next slide, please. The role of SME is my third point. Another feature of big tax lobbying in the EU is that they have been sponsoring startup and SME alliances, better say so-called startup and SME alliances. Some of them can rather be called front groups as they did represent rather the interests of big tech than the ones of some SMEs or startups. Just to drop a few names, Allied for Startups, uh, sponsored by Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple and Pinterest, or SME Connect, uh, connected to Meta, Google, Amazon and Uber, or ACT, the App Association, um, which has among its members Apple and Amazon. It fits very well into the narrative that big tech tries to spread that any regulation affecting them is killing innovation to have close ties to startups and SME positions. So that is something they foster uh, when they think about their lobbying strategies. My last point, and please go on to the next slide, is a few words about the role of economic consultancies such as Charles River Associates, Oxera, Compass Lexicon, RBB Economics and the likes all have uh, offices in Brussels. These consultancies share that they have big tech as clients. They support big tech in big merger processes in the EU. They also produce studies of, on behalf of them. For instance, on the Digital Markets Act, they did so. And or, they organize panels with policymakers and representatives of the business society and lobbyists. At the same time, these consultancies are not in the transparency register, which is a scandal. And the revolving door actually between DigiComp and economic consultancy remains and is quite open. A few conclusions. 
And please go to the next slide. We have seen big techs lobby power increasing. Their lobbying is at the same time partly intransparent. There's a huge imbalance of power between the voices that represent big tech in the policy process and the voices that represent civil society or digital SMEs. What can we draw from that? I've got three, three, uh, three uh, takeaways. First, we need more transparency in the political process. Means economic consultancies belong into the transparency register. Means trilogues need to become more transparent. We need to see the four column documents shortly after they have been produced. Means also that after the Qatar corruption scandal, the new good transparency rules on lobby transparency for MEPs need to be properly enforced. And that's a challenge. My question is here to you, do we have enough resources to make sure about this enforcement? Second takeaway, we need to address the imbalance of power question. Both the Juncker Commission and the von der Leyen Commission ask their commissioners, cabinets and even their officials to provide a balance in their lobby meetings. We are far away from that balance due to the imbalance of resources between companies and civil society, also in the parliament, as you may know. But still, we need an answer to that. One could make it, for instance, mandatory somehow that those with less resources are proactively heard more often in the political process. I have no legislation proposal here, but there is a need for it. That is something the parliament could press for. My third and final point is more general if you ask me how to reclaim our digital future and that uh, actually refrains with what, what my predecessor has said. Big talk takes economic and lobby power is immense. In many ways, the, the infrastructure of our societies is nowadays dependent upon them. With search engines, with clouds, with software, with spaces for social interaction, they provide critical infrastructure for our democracy. We are dependent upon them. This makes me feel uncomfortable, especially if you look at what happened to Twitter within days. Our conclusion is it is not enough to challenge big tech's lobby power. It is great to have the DMA, but not enough to challenge big tech's behavior by means of behavioral reforms and by interoperability. We need beyond that structural remedies to break up big tech and to reduce the economic power and dependency upon them. German competition law is a hope in this case. It has been renewed by the current traffic light government. It has now the tools to break up big tech after a sector investigation. The German competition authority should now go ahead and follow what is happening in the US and provide an example to the EU competition authority, DGCOM, to challenge both big tech's power and its lobby power. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for being on time. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you also for coming with these very concrete suggestions, what uh, solutions also could be. I think that is extremely helpful for, for our discussion. Um, we would take the next speaker in the room now, not remote. So I'm very happy um, to welcome Claire Fernandez. Well, because yes, you, you, you make more general points and then we go to specific pieces of legislation. Is that okay? Uh, Claire Fernandez is executive director of ADRI the organization that has European digital rights in its name, the largest network of 50 plus NGOs working to promote human rights in the digital age. Uh, before joining Edwish, she worked as deputy director of the European Network Against Racism and prior to that as an independent human rights consultant and as an advisor to the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights and represented the OSC in Bosnia and Kosovo. That's, that's a long way then to Brussels. <laughs> you have the floor, Claire. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for having me. Um, so when preparing for this event today, I was asking um, colleagues at EDRI what are their most crazy, most striking experience of corporate lobbying in the 20 years of history. And asking uh, digital rights activists for that list is like asking um, a toddler for Christmas present list. It's endless. Um, and similarly to the actual uh, disappointment of a toddler the day of Christmas, um, 
we see as well that through, repeatedly throughout the, the history, it almost always results in a weakening of the protection for people at the end. And the concern here, and my main point really, is that this is not a bug in the system, uh, but it's really EU digital policy vision and the EU decision-making process that favors corporates and security interests, and very often both together. The vision um, that is laid out in the digital decade or some of the EU strategies is really reading more like a business plan than a policy program. Uh, anything else, whether it's people's rights, the impact on the planet, feels like an afterthought. And there are many reasons for that, and one of the reasons is also corporate lobbying at every step of the way. Um, so I wanted to give some examples of what that power imbalance means for, for us, for NGOs, for people representing the non-profit sector, what this imbalance means and what these 113 million um, that, um, that was just explained represents compared to the money we have. And just to give an estimate, if we would put all of the NGOs working at Brussels, working on, on human rights at Brussels, you probably reach 10 million uh, total budget. So what does that mean in practice? Um, I see somebody saying it's not that bad, <laughs> but um, I just want to give an example of what the, the impact it has. And I wanted to focus on five with hopefully some concrete examples. First, um, we see a multiplication of forums, whether it's working group, high level groups, a code of conduct, um, and that's before the legislation and after the legislation, uh, stakeholder groups for where delegated acts are also discussed. And obviously, the more resources you have, the easier it is to influence all of them. For NGO, it's really hard because we are already on to the next cycle and on to the next issues. And a concrete example of that is the AI Act and the work that the Commission has been put forward on, the on AI. The high-level expert group at the time that was before the act was proposed had numerous uh, industry representatives while there was only one civil society representative our, our colleague fanny hitchbury from access now and the concrete result is that when the, the proposal came out it has been a, a legislation based on the risk-based approach not a human rights-based approach and concretely that also means that industry and AI companies were successful in lobbying for loopholes in those risks categorizations. Um, and we're really concerned that this could completely empty the regulation from being one if it's companies and developers actually deciding themselves what is a risk or not. A second way uh, in which this corporate influence is being felt is the multiplicity of ways that they, are, they can put forward to influence uh, decision making and Think Tank was one of them. We also see that the multiplication of industry association means that they can repeat their voice many times. Uh, an example is at the time of negotiation of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, Microsoft was a member of nine out of ten industry associations being able to repeat uh, their, their message. And um, colleagues describe a lobby storm. And at the time, Louis Michel, uh, an MEP, was, uh, there was a scandal of him being accused to literally copy-pasting all of Microsoft amendments. And we see less sophisticated um, ways, versions of that today, but this is still the case. A third uh, way has been explained around trilogues, um, but that also means that these um, 113 millions are only focusing on Brussels, but we see the ability of corporate um, lobbying to also reach capitals. And an example at the DSA, it was already mentioned how SMEs were used, but we also saw huge billboards, advertisements, I think, um, in Germany, expenses of seven million just on billboards in Germany. And I think anyone who has been uh, at the Brussels Central Station or airport has faced some of these um, Google or, or Facebook advertising. And this also had resulted in the weaker outcome that we, we had hoped. Uh, I'm sure colleagues will, will, will go in detail on that, but our demands on banning surveillance advertising were weakened because of this lobbying and this last stage on Trilog. For, uh, 
we also see a push on uh, pushing their narrative or shifting the timeline. So um, obviously we understand that regulation cannot go as fast as technology development. Um, but we also see that uh, big tech and state also interests play around the fact that we need to pass regulation really fast, but also um, delaying tactics and um, obstructing every step of the way. An example of that would be the, the famous e-privacy regulation that was proposed years ago to address surveillance capitalism to actually make online tracking impossible. And all industry, whether it's big tech, telco, uh, publishers, advertisers, we're all united in delaying tactics, in uh, obstructions. And so states were saying that the legislation at the beginning was too complex. And at the end, of course, after years of delays, that it was outdated. So the, this is just an example of so, some of the tactics that they use. And then finally, and also really worryingly, we also see examples of conflict, conflict of interests, um, of revolving doors, but also a concrete example could be how AI companies are selling their, who are selling their scanning products have been also um, advising parts of the European Commission in putting forward legislation, including the, the child sexual abuse regulation. So we see uh, really um, shocking ways in which uh, this conflict of interest also affect the European Commission. So a way forward, um, briefly, um, I would say should address the vision that the EU is putting forward on digital policies, should address the process of decision making, as the previous speakers mentioned, as well as funding. On the vision, it is clear that this vision should recenter people. Um, people, democracy, and the planet at the heart of what tech policy should look like. Uh, instead of profit and manipulation, we should put forward a technology that is based on respecting dignity, accessibility, justice, and really propose alternative to that business model, right? Uh, really proposing something else rather than like creating European champions to, you know, win the race to the US or China. On process, um, we would uh, agree to reforming trilogues and making sure that there's transparency and consultation at every step of the way, reducing the number of initiatives and forums um, that very often weaken regulation, um, having stricter enforcement of conflict of interest rules, but also indeed consultations and meaningful consultations of people affected by technology harms, um, including the most marginalized uh, of us and including people in the global south who also um, seeing the effect of the Brussels tech regulations. And then finally on funding, that vision of, uh, of a human-centric technology should also receive public funding. We should see the European Union putting forward uh, public infrastructure funds and funding community alternatives of technologies and funding for civil society organization. I'm not here talking just about um, institutional or um, philanthropic funding, but also individual donations and giving so that we can continue being independent in doing our work. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Claire. Uh, we uh, proceed with uh, Bren Bram Ranken, is that correct? <laughs> okay, Corporate Europe uh, Observatory. Bren Ranken is a campaign at Corporate Europe Observatory, a Brussels-based lobby watchdog that you all probably know very well. He conducts research and campaigns against big tech interference in EU decision making. And you're going to focus a little bit more, go on the AI Act, go a little bit more into detail. So yeah, you have I will, I will uh, go from the general to the more specific. So I'll talk a bit about the AI Act and how big tech has lobbied uh, the AI Act. You can immediately go to the fourth slide. Uh, yeah, next. Yeah, this one. So first of all, I won't go too much into what AI is and, and why it should be regulated, but just a few key points. First of all, um, 
I will definitely not go to, into a definition because um, the institutions have been going over a definition for years, but I will highlight some key features of AI. First of all, it's based on huge amounts of data. And based on that data, it will use mathematical correlations to get to a certain result or make a certain decision. And some AI programs will be uh, built on, on, on very advanced technologies, such as deep learning, for example, ChatGPT, but others can be more, uh, so to say, simple algorithms. And while that might sound technical, it's precisely because of the technical nature, the opaqueness how AI reaches certain results and the unaccountable nature uh, which makes AI systems prone to abuse. And one of the big scandals in the last couple of years is uh, the childcare benefit scandal in the Netherlands, where an algorithm was used to detect fraud of people scamming uh, uh, childcare benefits. But the algorithm didn't function well, and even worse, the algorithm was biased. So thousands of families were um, wrongfully accused, uh, mostly low-income families and families with a migration background, and had to pay money back uh, to the Dutch tax services. Um, thousands of people were subsequently indebted, lost their house, and more than 2,000 kids were put in foster care because their parents were indebted because of a biased algorithm which didn't, didn't function well. So just to give an impression of um, the impact um, an algorithm can have on people's lives. Um, this is, of course, not the only scandal. There are scandals all the time. Um, people were being fired by algorithms or people were being discriminated by uh, facial recognition software. Uh, you can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, nonetheless, AI has become uh, ever more important for big tech companies and their business models, uh, from recommender systems on social media to Google search results. These all use AI um, in their products. Um, for example, AI, uh, Google called itself an AI-first company uh, when speaking uh, with the European Commission. Now, of course, with ChatGPT, um, there has been a whole hype and investments have completely skyrocketed with uh, Microsoft announcing it will invest 10 million euros into OpenAI, Google investing hundreds of millions of euros into Anthropic and Hugging Face, and Amazon just announcing last month that it will invest another $4 billion in Anthropic as well. Um, crucially, as the AI Now Institute has said, there is no AI with, without big tech. Um, the scale, the amounts of data, the memory, um, this, this all favors big tech in dev developing these large-scale uh, language models such as uh, ChatGPT. That makes watertight regulation of AI all the more important. Um, but of course, we have seen uh, big tech fighting back against any regulation which, uh, will, which really forced them um, to, to conduct in a different way. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So as Claire has already mentioned, um, the basis for the AI Act was already um, was, was put in place in 2018 with this expert group on AI. And this expert group was heavily dominated by corporate interests. 20, 26 members out of, out of 57 were representing businesses um, such as Microsoft and Google, um, and only a few represented civil society. And um, interestingly enough, there has been there was a lot of internal criticism in this expert group, with an ethicist saying that the group was complete ethics washing, that it didn't that um, industry was very effective in pushing away any red lines on. Um, on, on, on AI systems or prohibiting AI, which is unacceptable. Subsequently, the, the AI Act was developed by the Commission. They worked on a proposal, and this, uh, we see the same there, that corporate interests were really 
uh, dominating the discussions or the meetings. So 66% of meetings between 2019 and 2021 with, the, with high level officials within the commission were with corporations or business associations. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, the situation in the parliament is uh, not that much better. Um, so we published a report earlier this year documenting more than a thousand meetings, of which 56% of those meetings were again with uh, business interests, and um, yeah, a, a, a very large a minority was with uh, civil society uh, organizations. We did we re, we did um, we did another calculation of the numbers of this year, 2023, because this is such an important year for the AI Act with the trialogues and the European Parliament uh, coming to. Uh, its position, and the numbers became even worse with 66% of meetings happening with uh, business uh, representatives. You can go to the next slide. But of course, um, meetings doesn't tell everything, and a lot of uh, speakers have already highlighted this extensive lobbying network by big tech funding consultancies, think tanks, law firms, uh, you name it. and. What caught my attention a couple of weeks ago was this uh, article on Politico, where an anonymous um, big tech lobbyist uh, was speaking about EU40, which is a sort of informal network event for MEPs, but is actually funded by big tech. This lobbyist said, of course, the official pitch is, you sponsor me, I organize an event for you. The unofficial pitch is, you sponsor me, I give access to this or that MEP. So there you can see that um, this funding is not innocent and that it buys effective uh, access to policymakers. You can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, this has also already been mentioned, uh, but of course financing research through think tanks is, and, and academics is really important in setting the terms of the public debate. Uh, so there is a study uh, which is focused on the United States, but which shows that 58% of AI ethics faculty receive big tech funding. So that shows that, that even the debate on, on what, what AI ethics should be is dominated or is, is, is uh, co-decided by, um, by big tech companies. And specifically on the AI Act, there was this uh, very interesting study by the Center for uh, Data Innovation, which is, again, an organization uh, funded by big tech companies like Amazon, which estimated the cost of the AI Act uh, being 31 billion euros. And of course, these figures capture the imagination of the media, so it was reported all across uh, the continent. Um, but in reality, it was just bogus science. And even um, a think tank on which these numbers were based called out um, Center for Data Innovation for just making stuff up. Um, you can go to the, to the next slide. Um, this, the second thing is, of course, the shady lobbying tactics. That's already been mentioned, um, the use of um, as, uh, groups which claim to represent SME startups or software developers but in reality receive money from big tech companies and also parrot their, their policy lines. Um, fortunately, there is a lot of awareness now about these tactics. I would say there is a lot more um, attention and anger from within the European Parliament on these kinds of tactics. Um, so earlier this year, we have, we have um, launched um, an encrypted mailbox where people can share confidential information to, and this is supported by a cross-party alliance of MEPs. So anybody in the room who has any confidential information, please uh, go to lobbyleaks.eu. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, you can skip this one. So what is the state of play on the AI Act? Um, I think um, industry has been quite successful, has been, as has been hinted at before, and um, pushing it in a certain direction. And although certain AI ses uh, systems will be prohibited, um, 
the industry has still successfully pushed for self-assessments uh, if a certain AI system is high risk. Um, general purpose AI systems such as um, um, ChatGPT, uh, it has been uh, big tech has heavily lobbied against um, against including it in the AI Act, uh, and we'll see what the outcome of of that will be. Um, then there is a role of standard setting bodies, which uh, will play a, a, an important role in implementing the AI Act, but it's actually also dominated by corporate interests. So even after the act is concluded and has been decided by the institutions, um, there will still be a, a big role for the industry to influence implementation. And lastly, some there is some very obvious oversights in the AI Act, for example, Military AI, which is probably the most controversial and most problematic AI systems there are, uh, is even excluded from, from the AI Act. So, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So, um, uh, yeah, this is, this is my last one. Um, so, yeah, money should obviously not buy access, which is unfortunately happening now. Um, and we think we should go to uh, firewall measures. What does that mean? Uh, in the case of big tobacco, because of the very um, unethical lobbying tactics, there was a firewall implemented by the World Health Organization between policymakers, health, health policymakers, and the industry. And actually, uh, we should start thinking if this, if this is not the way to go for Jafam uh, for big tech companies. And as has been mentioned before, we should, the EU should reach out to voices with less resources uh, who do not have the opportunity, the money, the resources to lobby um, the EU as the industry is able to do. Thanks. I really like the big tobacco idea. <laughs> um, speaking of the AI Act, my colleague walked in, Kim van Sparentag, uh, our leading MEP on AI, doing really great work, and she will moderate the Q&A when we get there. <laughs> we still have two speakers to go. Um, we have Clara Helming next from Algorithm Watch. She is remotely with us, I hope so. She's on the remote link. Okay, great. Clara is a senior advocacy and policy manager at Algorithm Watch. And uh, before joining Algorithm Watch, she led the campaign work of the anti corruption organization Parla Parliamenten Watch Day. Parliament Watch Day. Okay, great. And this is, this is really nice for me because the first organization that I talked to when I became an MEP uh, was Algorithm Watch, which is a Berlin based uh, organization. So, very happy to have you here, Clara. And you have the floor for inviting me. Um, just a very brief, um, small um, correction. At the, the other organization is called Abgeordnetenwatch, um, which is very funny because it's very similar to Algorithm Watch. Uh, one is watching parliamentarians and the other one is watching algorithms. Um, but now I'm going to be talking about um, watching the algorithms. Um, and um, I have um, brought to share with you um, one example um, that I think can highlight this imbalance between uh, tech companies and um, the, the big tech, um, I'm sorry, uh, between um, big, big tech companies and the CSOs that several of um, the other speakers have already mentioned. Um, and just to give like a different perspective um, all on all of these issues, I will not be talking about actual lobbying measures, but just highlighting um, this great imbalance that we see in, in power and resources between these two groups. So um, Algorithm Watch, um, what we try to do is to find out how um, algorithms work, um, for example, in, in social media companies. and. Um, in 2020, um, Algorithm Watch um, did a research project on Instagram um, where we asked volunteers to um, use a browser extension that uh, scraped their Insta Instagram feed uh, and provided us with anonymized uh, data uh, so that we can investigate which kind of pictures and which kind of posts uh, each user was shown. Um, and many volunteers signed up to do this. 
uh, and we had some, some quite interesting results. Um, for example, um, we found this may not, this is probably not surprising, but that um, on Instagram, uh, posts with text don't perform as well as um, posts with pictures, uh, with faces, um, and also that um, the Instagram feed um, um, endorses certain types of, of body images, like showing a little bit of skin but not too much nudity. So this kind were the kinds of first results that we found in this project. Um, and um, we wanted to continue working on this um, and confronted um, uh, Meta to get a, a statement on these results. Um, and uh, as a result of this, um, Meta actually um, reacted with some very thinly well veiled threats uh, for legal action um, and um, af we had to um, actually stop um, collecting this data, had to stop the research project even though we had some, some very good first results um, because um, as a very small organization, right now we're, we're 30 people I think back then, it was probably more like 15 or something, um, we could not afford to go up against um, the, the giant of, of Meta. Um, and we're not the only researchers that face this problem. Um, there are several research, researchers, for example, from um, NYU, that also had to stop their research. Um, and um, we are actually not continuing this kind of work where we scrape data. At the moment, we're thinking about different ways to, to audit um, social media platforms um, in, the, in the future, um, but this is, this is not the type of um, thing that we, that we do um, currently, even though we all know from the um, Francis Hogan uh, Facebook files um, that uh, Meta itself knows that it has some shortcomings and it's actually deciding not to act on many of them. Um, so um, this maybe just shows um, the, the kind of imbalance that, that we are facing. We think that it, this is a, um, a very big problem um, because um, one of the prerequisites of democracy um, is, or for, in, in a democracy, we have to be able to um, hold the people that create these technologies accountable. Um, and to do so, we actually have to understand how the technology works. It has to be understandable to us. Uh, and we believe that it is actually as democratic societies, our duty um, to decide which kind of um, decisions we want to let algorithms um, take um, and um, which we don't. And so we're very, very much looking towards the um, regulations that have already been discussed here um, to um, ad advance this cause. And I think in the interest of time, um, I will maybe stop here and look forward to your questions in the Q&A. <laughs> We are very grateful <laughs> for taking taking uh, time into account, Clara, and thanks a lot for, for your contribution. I think that merits. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we come to our next speaker. A particular pleasure to introduce Tanya O'Carroll. Tanya is an independent advisor, strategist, and leader focused on tech accountability, human rights, and social justice. In addition to consulting for a wide range of NGOs and philanthropic organizations, she is a senior fellow at Foxglove, where, we, where she is suing Facebook to challenge its harmful model of surveillance advertising. Tanya coordinates a growing platform accountability movement in the EU called People vs. Big Tech, which brings together 120 plus organizations working collectively for stronger regulation of the dominant tech platforms. And I can say we worked a lot together on the Digital Services Act and the, the work you did with this organization was absolutely amazing. So very, very to have you tonight and you have the floor, Tanya. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and it's a total pleasure to be here. I wish I, I was joining you in person and not um, not from my little garden. Um, I'm going to talk. I've had the, I've been working in the digital rights slash human rights field for the best part now of um, 15 years, and so a lot like Claire said, I've kind of got my own uh, long wish not wish list uh, Christmas list, as you put it, of uh, experiences um, working with and against and uh, trying to change big tech uh, companies from within, from without. And I'm going to be kind of drawing on those experiences I, as I make these comments and particularly comment around two dimensions to the big tech influencing machinery that I see 
One we've already talked about a lot tonight, which is the direct lobbying influence. Um, we're talking about the money, the armies of lobbyists in Brussels, the PR machinery. But I also want to talk about something that I think is um, it has been totally pivotal to understanding how we got where we got to right now in terms of um, uh, of waking up to the threat of big tech. Um, and it's often a bit more uncomfortable to talk about, but I think it's also this soft influence of the companies and the way that they have shaped the actual digital rights field itself over the last, you know, more than a decade. Um, but to begin with the first point, which is the direct lobbying, you know, talking about the Digital Services Act, this has already been mentioned a couple of times, but we really saw this almost kind of unmasking of big tech's lobbying machinery during the uh, negotiations for the DSA, particularly when it came to the proposals for a ban on surveillance advertising. I think all of us knew what the companies were capable of. We knew the sizes of their comms team. We knew that the budgets they had, and yet we were still left kind of jaw open at what, what they were able to pull out, you know, out of the bag in, in the final phases of the DSA. Um, and it showed that they were terrified, right? I think in some ways it was a direct response to the fact how successfully in the course of just less than a year, the proposal to ban surveillance advertising had, had gathered momentum. Um, but, you know, one stat for me really stands out. It, Claire sort of touched on it, but I think it's worth underscoring this statistic, which came from lob the great work of lobby control, which was that in 2021, Facebook spent um, in billboard and print advertising in Germany alone, 6.8 million euros, which was more than it had spent um, on lobbying in Brussels the entire year before in 2020, according to the EU Transparency Register. I mean, that was the amount with which they ramped up in the fight against surveillance ads, and that was the ads we're talking about that were promoting, um, you know, how important tracking ads were for SMEs, the ones that were all over Brussels Airport, the ones that I'm told by my colleagues in Ireland were pretty much continuously um, down the, the Irish uh, radio waves uh, in those months as well. And I think it, it's telling because it shows us, you know, it wasn't just that, it was also, I mean, they ran, they sponsored Politico Morning Tech for months. Um, you know, the, 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 they there was, what they really did around that kind of fighting that narrative piece around SMEs and tracking ads was quite phenomenal. Um, and I think, well, it, it, it shows what they're capable of. It also shows what's always there behind the scenes in terms of the discourse. And it's one of the reasons why I think we don't have GDPR being enforced in the way that it should be in terms of the letter of the law. It's one of the reasons why we still have e-privacy regulation languishing after so many years and no sense of, of if or when um, that will, will move forward. And I think it shows that essentially whenever this issue of tracking ads, this issue that touches the core um, revenue profit incentive at the heart of uh, Facebook and Google's um, business model, then we are going to see them throw the kitchen sink at trying to defeat these proposals. And that, of course, goes the same um, when we talk about structural power and market dominance and things like merger controls. And I think that that should tell us all in this room when we're on the right track. <laughs> These are the things that we should be talking about more and that where regulation is most needed. Uh, the second issue I wanted to talk about, um, as I mentioned, is kind of less comfortable, which is, I think, explains a bit how we got here, which is the, the soft power and soft influence that big tech has played over, over more than a decade. During the 2010s, um, I think civil society, for many justifiable and good reasons, were primarily focused on what states were doing in terms of internet, in terms of so-called back then internet freedom. Um, we, you know, we had the Snowden revelations or in terms of the scale of mass surveillance uh, by the world's leading intelligence agencies. We had one law, bad law after another in terms of uh, often under the guise of anti-terror legislation or cyber, uh, cyber crime around the world. And it was very clear that state overreach in terms of surveillance and censorship was what we, what we had our eyes on as a digital rights field. Um, I think big tech companies were very clever in the way that during those early years, and I'm thinking, you know, around, especially around the Snowden disclosures, that they allied themselves um, and aligned themselves to civil society and to the digital rights field. I'm thinking of things like RightsCon, with the very first RightsCon, which is still the leading tech and human rights uh, summit worldwide, organised by Access Now. In 2011, I think the very first one was there that I went to. You know, it was, it was very much what can we, the we being big tech companies and Silicon Valley and civil society do about the, the threat from, um, from government to kind of break our internet. Um, and yeah, it, it's sort of, 
it led to, I think, uh, while we were so busy looking at what governments were doing, we sort of failed to look up and realise that under our noses, these companies had essentially built an economic machinery that had amount, amounted to the kind of a mass surveillance system, which is what it is, uh, of the likes that GCHQ and the NSA could only have dreamed of. Um, and so I think we woke up very, very late. The digital rights field woke up very, very late to the threat of, of big tech. And I also attended so many conferences in those years, whether it was the Internet Governance Forum and it was Facebook hosting the after party at the Internet Governance Forum in Mexico in 2016, where everybody would come straight out of their panels and, you know, go and hold a blue uh, cocktail glass uh, at the Facebook garden party flooded with blue lights everywhere or um, or in substantive conversations in some of these spaces where it felt increasingly that you know it was lonely voices that wanted to talk about the business model and that wanted to talk about structural power and market dominance that there was just not a space in in those you know there was not an independent space for civil society there was some degree of soft capture i think um for, for many years which is why we woke up late and it's why that when we came to the digital services act i would argue that the proposal for a ban on surveillance advertising wasn't even part of the public policy discourse until the law had been drafted um, and it was thanks to you know many of the with some of the MEPs in this room to, to Alexandra to Kim to the members of the tracking free ads coalition to some fantastic work from Edri um, and, and other organizations in Europe that I think were able to turn that round over the course of the year and we saw as a result you know what the, what the big tech companies threw at us in response so i think we are more ready now than we have been in the past but i think it's still really important you know rightscon is i checked it today is still sponsored by between 15 and 20 technology companies including all of the five big ones amazon meta uh, google microsoft apple um and i think it, it you know well, as we turn to the work that's to come and the next European Commission and the next European Parliament, I think we need a civil society and um, policymakers to be putting our sights squarely on how do we tackle the problem of the business model and how do we tackle the structural power question that has been mentioned by others. And for me, that business model part is not just surveillance advertising, which is fundamental and vital, but it's also the predatory and addictive design features and algorithms that um, keep people's eyeballs locked on their screens um, in order to generate advertising revenue. Um, and for me, that's the work, you know, to what, what do we need to do in terms of our digital future? It, that is the work to come. The DSA and the DMA are starting points. They are certainly not the horizon. Um, and I really feel like what we learnt collectively, the lessons that we learnt during the fight for the DSA will prepare us um, for that. But I also think, you know, that we, we, we need to make sure that we have um, that there is really no space. Back to your point, Bram, you know, big tech is just playing from the, the playbook of big tobacco at this point. And, you know, you wouldn't have, or, or big oil, you, know, you wouldn't have a climate change conference that was sponsored by Shell. And I think it's really important that we kick out um, the, the influence and, and the direct financing as well, because there's direct financing in, in, for many NGOs, especially in the global majority, um, that big tech continues to, to have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that, that last intervention. Also, the, the focus on the business model. Um, I, I think we really need to do what you said to save our democracy, because this is, this is absolutely vital for our democracy, the addictive business model. Um, the spread of disinformation um, powered by algorithms because this brings profit to the companies. This will, in the end, really threaten our democracy as we know it. And this is why it is so important that we did have some successes um, with the Digital Services Act because I think it's important to underline how the lobbying influences the legislation, but also how we managed, and, and Tanya said it was, it was really um, jaw-dropping the kind of, of what, they, what they were able to achieve in terms of, of, of money, in terms of having billboards basically everywhere. Everybody had it on their social networks, you know, who walked in and out of parliament. You know, every second post, basically, an ad I saw was a Google and Facebook ad saying, well, you can't abolish surveillance targeting, but they didn't frame it like that, but that was the idea. Um, and, and you landed in Brussels airport, and the first thing I thought when I, when I stepped out of the plane, that was it. And when I waited for the luggage, you know, it was Meta, and before it was Google, and at Brussels train station, it was, it was like, you know, are these guys are following me around or what? <laughs> it was impressive. But still, we did get the ban um, to use 
the data of minors for in, in, in the profiles uh, in. And it's the thing that now the commission is really selling us the big achievement of the DSA. That's really interesting. And also the fact that you're not, that, that, that you can't use um, sensitive data, um, it's, it's in there. I mean, and the companies really didn't want that. So we, we still can build on that. So I think the glass is sort of half full and, and half, half empty. It's, it's really strong guys we're up against, but we did achieve things in the digital legislation. And I think that's really important to say and, and that should encourage us. And with this, I hand over finally to Kim van Sparentak, leading MEP on AI, leading on the addictive design INI that we have fought for in the IMCO committee. It's an initiative on an initiative report that could lay the foundations for, for some important piece of legislation in the next, in the next mandate. Over to you. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Um, yes, I'm sorry for being late. Uh, I, yeah, I can basically blame big tech lobbying for the reason I wasn't here because I was trying to solve uh, to save the platform work directive, which is also um, a beautiful piece of legislation that uh, they are trying to uh, lobby. Uh, in such a way that it will be killed in the end. Um, so, but um, enough about me. Now it's time for all of you uh, because now it's time for the Q and A. We're a bit behind, so like we we have max ten minutes. Um, but um, oh, I already see a lot of hands. Please keep them short, and I'll go for you first. Um, I just I just had one question um, about trilogues. So. Uh, there was a question uh, earlier, a suggestion about making them more transparent, and I was wondering if that possibly falls into the hands, like plays into the hands of corporate lobbying because it gives more chances to influence the legislation, and they are the ones that have the more resources to be mobilized uh, from one day to the next when a trilogue happens. So I wonder if that puts civil society even further behind. I think it's the, or rather the other way around. What we see now is that uh, because of the secrecy involved in trialog negotiations, big tech or other wealthy companies will have the resources. They are able to be so close to the decision-making process that they, that they do have these documents. And it's the citizens who do not have access, um, who, who are not, who, do not have the connections with policymakers who don't have access to the do these documents. And I think, for example, um, anybody who has a pro account on Politico will often receive these uh, four column documents, uh, which are of, of, of trial or meetings, but a pro account costs uh, at least 20,000 euros. So who can, who can um, afford such a sum of money to follow these negotiations from such a from so close by. Yeah, thanks so much. I have the feeling you were there last night when uh, actually um, we had a trilogue where um, someone said something that the tech lobby had been saying for two years. And luckily, that person was called out. But you can exactly see how much influence the big tech lobby has. And, Luckily, we, we managed to have someone also calling that out. But um, yeah, we, uh, we really need to make sure that uh, we have more transparency also on these kind of things. Yes. Thanks a lot. I'm Alina from the London Story. Um, my question is towards Tanya and to Claire, I guess. Uh, since, Claire, you mentioned that there needs to be more stakeholder consultations, including people from the global majority. And uh, I specifically work on hate speech in India, and therefore much of the things that need to be done in the rest of the world when it comes to making sure that big tech also behaves there. And I was wondering if there was any research that you'd come across or any experiences you'd come across of um, also there being a deliberate attempt to silence voices from the global south to say, ah, in the EU, we shouldn't be talking about that. Um, of course, we know that silicon values, so those embedded in big tech are very much white, very much male. Um, and I was wondering if there's any more explicit ways that you might have encountered. I haven't um, experienced like explicit exclusion, but I think um, besides indeed uh, like uh, Silicon Valley being very US and male, 
Um, I think the European decision-making space is, on, is also not particularly known for being uh, diverse, um, is also not particularly known for being easy to access, um, easy to understand and accessible for people who are most affected. So this is work that we are also trying to be aware of our role as civil society when there are legislation that could affect the global south, but also um, realizing the Brussels effect of a legislation if Europe is passing a restrictive regulation that you know it can be used by in authoritarian context to say Europe is doing it, we you know we can also um, and and very much being aware of that uh, well in advance when the, the legislation is being proposed. Thank you. Yes. Oh, Tanya, do you want to say something? Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to add, uh, aside from the point that Claire made, something that I have seen a lot of, and I'm sure, Elena, you've seen this too, and actually I think that there are people like, great work being done by people like um, Odanga Madung in Kenya, an investigative journalist, that just shows how much money is going from platforms like Meta and Google into funding small NGOs in global majority countries. Um, and I've, I've had actually, I've had a, a LGBTQ organization from the Caribbean that got in touch with me um, because they were taking a grant for their work on fighting back against um, homophobia and transphobia. And they were concerned, they were like, should we be taking this money? And it, the, 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 no one has an image, uh, you know, a, a, there's no kind of register of how much of these small grants go to these small and under-resourced organizations in large parts of the world that allow then, uh, in moments like during the Kenyan elections last year, which is when Odanga was documenting this, a lot of, he, you know, these are his words, not mine, you know, Kenyan civil society was very, very captured when it came to um, you know, pushing back against Meta to put much more, put mitigation measures in place. Um, and that he was organizing, there was a number of uh, Kenyan organizations who were organizing, but a lot of the groups that they were trying to rally were taking funding um, directly from Meta as part of its, you know, fact checking uh, grants and, uh, and disinformation grants. And so I think, you know, it's, yeah, there's, there's looking at the, the influence operation and how it actually plays out in affecting legislation um, around the world is, I think, uh, something as, as important for us to do. If I can just make a very brief comment. Um, wh when I started on, on hate speech, when I started working here four years ago, um, in parts of the digital rights community, the fight against hate speech was still considered something similar to wanting censorship. So there was absolutely no consensus that hate speech is a problem. And it took, I think, these, these past three or four years to turn around that discourse and say, well, hate speech actually is an attack on the freedom of speech, on the freedom of speech of women, on the freedom of speech who are victims of racist discrimination and so on. But it, it was a battle. And it was really something we, I, I very actively worked on reframing, and I talked about this to a lot of people, because in the beginning, the, the digital rights community, or at least parts of it, um, saw that, feared a little bit that would be an attack on, on the free speech of everybody. And I think we managed to turn it around, pointing out that the problem are not single posts and single contributions, but really the algorithms, the business model, and so on. So I think a lot of a lot has happened here, here in Brussels. Um, a lot more women going into digital rights or being more, more visible. Um, some some racist anti-racist activists being more more on the digital topics, and I think that is very positive, and that should be extended um, to, to the global majority countries, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Um, you in the back. Hi, um, this is Nicola Morris. Like I'm working at the Future Society, uh, a think tank that has uh, suffered from the uh, overtures from uh, from industry as well in the past, uh, but we have uh, we have remained independent. We have worked uh, with some of these big tech players on on a, a specific uh, events. Uh, but always as part of other things, we can talk about that uh, as well. I'm um, actually uh, recently we have documented the the corporate irresponsibility uh, that we are witnessing in this space. So not not at the lobbying level, but like you know also at uh, uh, standardization um, in uh, contractual negotiations, in any form of engagement with the rest of society, or even internally, uh, the way they 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 clamp down on. Uh, on their internal criticism as well. Um, and my concern is that like, 
we have seen, because the Future Society has been active for like uh, eight years, like we have seen the quality of the debate decrease significantly because of the, the interventions of, uh, of big tech. Like the, the mention that like, you know, this faculty, so a lot of academia is also uh, funded by big tech, results in like, you know, literally like misguiding the focus of, uh, of uh, legislators. Um, you know, like, for example, focus on, on exclusively on, on facial recognition or on use cases as opposed to like, there's a much broader range of, of bias and, and trustworthiness issues in AI. Um, if there was like one thing that you would like uh, civil society to do to raise awareness amongst your co-legislators to, to make sure that like they understand that they are being like, you know, they are being misled, like what would it be like one or two things uh, uh, that perhaps like a third party could do? in order to, to kind of redress a bit the situation, because it's a very unfair fight. It's a very, uh, uh, yeah, we feel, we feel outgunned, but like perhaps there is like a low hanging fruit that you feel civil society is not doing enough. Thank you. Well, there's, there's one thing I've been in, in contact with some, with some civil society organizations about, and that is actually not even um, trying to educate MEPs or politicians, but trying to educate their assistants because a lot of MEPs, as soon as it's about digital aspects, they're like, boo, sounds complicated. <laughs> and that's where it ends. And they're like, yeah, and there's a few in my group that understand it, I think, so we'll follow them. And of course, Google and Facebook know the most because they're the biggest, so they might explain it the best. You know, that's a bit, um, uh, a bit the vibe sometimes that is happening. So also when it came to the Artificial Intelligence Act, at some point we were in touch with some organizations saying like maybe that would actually be one of the best things to you know have a fun workshop where you explain artificial intelligence so that people don't think only about weird hollywood scenarios for example but that we actually um you know have these kind of trainings so that that at least the appas can say hey i don't think this is like this nonsense that you're hearing right now is like something that you should believe in so that's one of the things that we've been thinking about I don't know, I just wanted to react to the framing of that question, which is like, what are civil society not doing enough? I think um, the question would be, what are we doing? And is it our role to do that? Um, and um, here we have been talking about how much corporate lobbying is doing too much. So um, I'm not sure is the role necessarily of civil society of educating decision makers about the role they play in democratic society and that they should represent the people that, have been, that they do represent, rather than centering uh, corporate interests. You know, like I, I just wanted to also clearly react to that. We do as much as we can when it comes to informing people about the consequences of AI and other technologies. But I also think there is a power difference here in what we are able to achieve, especially to um, actually train MEPs and train their assistants and, and others. Sorry, jumping in all the time. Um, something I would like not not so much non-governmental organizations to do, because as Claire said, you're already doing an, an amazing amount of things with very little money and very little, very few people. Um, I think having like a movement that says for academia, for universities, research institutions, taking Google, Meta, Amazon money is not cool. We are not doing this. That would be a great thing. And then, you know, as Parliament, what one thing we I tried, I was I was the doing coordinator in the AI special committee when it existed. And I tried to say, I only want people from academia who come from an institution that doesn't take big tech money. And we didn't get a majority for that, no way. Um, so having some kind of opinion movement coming maybe from academia saying, well, Let's really distinguish, because I mean, lobbying, if companies say, well, this is our interest, that's fine. The problem is if the university professors, if academia comes and still tells me what the Google interests are, but with a different label on it. So having some kind of movement among academia saying it's uncool to take big tech money, that would be great. And now they have, one of the reasons they, they did take it was because you also get the, the access, you got the access to the data only when you were sort of favorable to, the, to those companies. And this is something we changed with the DSA. Now research institutions can get vetted and can get access to big tech data. So there's still the money argument, but this is more about you know having policies in member states, countries, having public funding for research. So that's something we need to ask for politically. 
um, but then make it uncool for research institutions, uh, for researchers, for universities to take big tech money, and then we could follow up as a parliament in politics everywhere saying we don't want experts come from institutions that take, uh, take Google money. I think that, that would be a great thing to do. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I saw there were some other questions, but <clears throat> we're already actually in the time of the drinks, and I also don't want to keep you away from the drinks because but the only thing between me uh, between you and the drinks is now me. Um, so, and I think there's a lot of things we can still discuss also amongst each other. Um, so I, I will just say thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I think uh, the, the, the discussion we had and the examples uh, really show uh, how the big tech lobby operates and also to the need for us all to stand united because you know they are it's really a david versus goliath thing i'm always very impressed how much david manages to still get through but you know goliath is uh, is is massive so um we have to make sure our digital future is in the hands of people and not of large corporations um and you know just this morning i encountered the big tech lobby again on the vote on tackling addictive design of online services we had negotiated the report in detail with all the groups on board but after the lobbying of the big uh, big platforms the ecr group suddenly turned started saying things that were completely untrue about what happened in the negotiations um it only resulted in one abstention luckily but it sh still shocks me also how direct these lines are you know like once they say one thing one day an hour later we hear they are flipped like this is how how fast it goes and also on the AI Act, you know, we see all these concepts such as like general purpose AI is something that should not be part of the um, of the AI Act because it's general purpose. I mean, it's being put on the table all the time. So um, I think um, that is something that we, we really have to also counter and also call it out when it happens. And I think that is happening more and that's that's very good. Um, and uh, yeah, what I was just mentioning, the platform work directive, also there, um, the, the, the lobby tactics of Uber and Deliveroo has been really incredible. Like the Deliveroo lobbyist was literally standing in front of the room where the EPP um, working group that was going to decide how they were going to vote were like were meeting they were standing literally in front and clapping like come on go get them like this was sort of the vibe they're like they have no shame um and also uber like they spread all these different kind of narratives and different kinds of papers so that we couldn't talk anymore with our colleagues so they created some sort of you know a uh, situation where 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 we couldn't we we did not have um any way of of actually trying to negotiate anymore because we all had a different idea of what was actually on the table but in the end, the tricks are always the same. You know, we have these weird shadow lobbies. We have these with think tanks and vague SME alliances. We have the funding of studies by academics. Um, yesterday, we also got just before the AI trilogue, a very beautiful email from someone like, I am a very important academic. And these are the points that I have researched. And this is exactly what you should do. And I was like, OK, this is one on one what the big tech companies are saying. Thank you, very important academic, and also thank you for not enclosing your paper. Um, so, um, yeah, and then of course they also have all these targeted advertising um, uh, at policymakers, indeed in the stations, everywhere. At some point, between the, my house and my partner's house, there were two ads saying that we shouldn't <laughs> ban surveillance advertising, and then I got really paranoid. I don't know if they just put it everywhere, but I don't know. <laughs> So um, I think, you know, we have to really be, be aware of that. But also, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that I find really annoying is also how some politicians and EU officials are just scrambling around these big tech guys. How they all think they are so fantastic and interesting and they all want selfies with, you know, Sam Altman and Senator Pichai and they're so proud when they are able to meet them. Or it's like, they're the baddies, you know, they should not... They're not that cool. They sh that shouldn't be a cool thing. That should be something you should be ashamed of. Yeah. So, and of course, the, the problem is that if, like, they have to think that they are cool, they have this thing that, you know, they're pink washing themselves all the time. All the prides are sponsored by Google, you know, it's, it's a cool place to be. And then their narrative is also really strong. You know, we need innovation. And, in and if we don't have innovation, we won't have growth and Europe will fall apart. So, and, and there's just enough um groups unfortunately that fall for that and i think um you know uh we have to also really like call their them for their bs when they say these things you know we need european 
uh, the, this whole, we need European champions like Facebook. Well, I don't want a European Facebook. I think that's a bad idea. And um, also like, you know, like SMEs will be harmed if we have rules for big tech companies. Like that, even that sentence doesn't make any sense. So this is really something what uh, we really have to, uh, to fight against. So um, I think, you know, one of the solutions is definitely to have more transparency, to get rid of our, our quite complex and non-transparent -tran legislative process. And we really, we really have tried so many times already, also after Qatargate, to, to make, make changes, especially as groups, we have pushed really for more things in the reforms. But unfortunately, you know, um, uh, there are still uh, a lot of groups that uh, feel that um, being able to be a bit more behind the scenes is, uh, is beneficial for them. So um, I think um, we really have to, as politicians, do better as well. We have to be more transparent as well. We also have to make sure that the access um, of these lobbyists um, is, is more equalized with civil society. We have to be able to, to reach out to civil society more um, from, our from our side and not be able, but we know we're very able, but we have to do it more. Um, and um, I think uh, we have to try to involve civil society and people in public process in uh, all the political processes because in the in the end we as MEPs we are here to represent the people not business so that is I think the most important thing that uh, we have to take along and um, all the amazing work that the civil societies organizations are doing first of all to fight back against this tech lobby but secondly to also uncover what they are doing is absolutely crucial for our work because it makes us it makes it easier for us to name and shame the ones that are going along with their narratives. So thank you again for all being here tonight. Thank you so much to the speakers uh, for being here with us today. Um, I have to say, follow the Greens on social media, which I think is very funny. <laughs> um, uh, we uh, follow our newsletter, to, uh, the, which is not social media, I guess, um, when you want to know more about the events we are holding. And please enjoy the drinks and each other's company. Thank you. Oh, and of course, thanks for the amazing team that organized this and who also wrote the notes and excluded themselves. So thank you so much. <laughs>